Marie, I want to go to your school. <laughs> Man, I bet your kids have fun, don't they? <laughs> uh, well, good morning, everyone. I am uh, I'm thrilled that we're all gathered here today, and, and uh, I want to remind everyone of the trunk or treat we're doing Thursday, right outside here, trunk or treat. They had a trunk or treat kind of thing with uh, the, Mar uh, the Downtown Merchants Association um, yesterday or Friday around 5 o'clock, and the stores were handing out stuff, and there was a few tables set up. It just didn't feel like Halloween to me. Let's make it feel like Halloween this Thursday night, okay? Um, last year, we had, uh, we had lots of kids that come through, so I'm just hoping you'll join us, because the, the, the best thing about uh, Trunk or Treat is uh, it takes the pressure off of you. I know it takes the pressure off me. Back when I used to live in the suburbs, my biggest fear was running out of candy before all the kids came through. You guys remember that? Well, um, there's a the Christian writer, Lori Beth Jones. She wrote about Halloween in her book called Grow Something Besides Old. I love that title. Grow Something Besides Old. And she said um, one Halloween she ran out of candy, and instead of uh, turning out the lights, that's what I used to do, just <laughs> turn out the lights. <laughs> She decided to pass out dimes and quarters to the kids. And uh, a little girl about, oh, I forgot to do that. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. I want to do the joke first. <laughs> so we had a little girl about five that came to the door, and she was dressed like a fairy, and she had a magic wand. And Lori Beth dropped two quarters in her candy bag, and she says, now when you get home, tomorrow you can turn them into candy. And the little girl stepped back and looked up at her and said, Lady, this ain't a real wand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go back and do what I forgot to do here. Grab your Bible and let's pray. <clears throat> That's actually a good order. Joke, then pray. Yeah. All right. I am no longer my own but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing put me to suffering, let me be put to work for you, or set aside for you, praise for you, criticize for you, let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing, I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service, and now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which we have made on heaven, on earth, let it also be made in heaven. And all the people say, Amen. Want me to tell the joke again? No, that's good. <laughs> all right. All right. So I think all of you already know that Halloween is a word that's blended from the word All Hallows Eve, right? All Hallows Eve. Um, and that All Hallows, Hallows means. Um, to make holy. Like when we say the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, we're saying God's name. We're going to make it holy in our heart, right? So that's what hallows mean. And All hallows Eve is the evening before All Saints Day. And um, one of the reasons um, we're doing All Saints Day this Sunday is I'm superstitious. I never like to celebrate big events like that after the fact. So rather than doing All Saints Sunday Next week, after All Saints Day, I wanted to do it the Sunday before, so we understand what it means to be celebrating when the day comes, okay? So that's why we, we shifted this around. And um, what you may not know, though, is that originally All Saints Day was on May 13th. Back, back, way back in the, you know, three, four, five hundred A.D., they observed it on May 13th. But there was also another holiday or a celebration that was held on November 1st, 2nd. It was called um, Samhain. And it's a Celtic festival. That's a Celtic word. And this is a time when the, when the Druids believed that the veil between the living and the dead was so thin that the wicked souls could come through. So they would worship to the god Sawin and ask for, and, and he would have all the evil spirits come into the world and annoy us. Okay. So the church moved the holiday, 
right to there. The idea being that by showing Christ's light, we could eventually overcome what, what the celebration was all about in its truest sense, worshiping evil. They did a pretty good job. There's still lots of remnants of Halloween, and we're going to talk about that. But uh, way, way back in the day, what they would do is uh, uh, the Druids or the Celtics, they would, they would dress up like uh, witches or goblins or uh, some other little spirit. And the idea is that that would frighten away or the other spirits that came to the world wouldn't know that they were just people. And they could, they could hide within the evil spirits. And the other thing they would do is they would take gourds and they would carve scary faces in the gourds and put candles in them and put them outside their doors to, to keep the evil spirits away or to let them know that this house is already, we got it covered. And just in case that didn't work, they would also set out treats for the demons. They'd put out little plates of fruit and vegetables because they were worried that the demons might not be happy and then they start to do tricks on them and torment them and damage their homes. I don't think they had toilet paper back in the day, but... <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> but uh, can you all imagine living back in the, in the dark ages when Christianity was just starting to get its feet and, and that was the prevailing belief system? That's pretty spooky. What kind of a, it's kind of a frightening place to live, but I, I do have to ask the question, who here believes in ghosts? Who here believes? It's okay. Yeah. Some, some of you do, some of you don't. The funny thing is that for thousands and thousands of years, everybody believed in the supernatural. Everybody believed in the supernatural. I think one of the funniest uh, verses in the Bible is when Jesus is walking on the water it's uh, Luke uh, 24, verse 37. <clears throat> and the, the disciples are all like, ah, a ghost. Remember it says, uh, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. So we know, get a little feedback there. So we know that we, uh, ghosts were a thing, even in Jesus' time. King Saul, he conjured up the spirit of Samuel. Might be a stray microphone or something we got. Oh, go, go hammer some nails, Paul. <laughs> so ghosts, ghosts have been a thing all through history. So how, let me ask again, how many of you all believe in the supernatural? Right. I mean, do you believe in prayers being granted? Do you believe in miraculous healing? Do you believe uh, angels guiding us? Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Then you believe in the supernatural. <laughs> but you know what else the supernatural includes? It also includes malevolent spirits and demons and ghosts. Did anybody ever hear experience ghosts? Got any good ghost stories? I have to be honest, my wife Becky and I, we love to go ghost hunting. You're not surprised, are you? <laughs> so many years ago, we volunteered to be locked up inside the old St. Augustine jail all night on death row. And I still remember we were, uh, we were sitting in there, we were sitting at the metal table, and it was pitch black. You couldn't see a thing. And I had my camcorder sitting on the table running. And uh, the curator of the museum, he says that um, um, if you call out the name of one or two of the executed prisoners who were known, known for making noise, you, you might hear something. So, we, of course, we're sitting there, we're banging on the table, and we're making noises, and, and we're calling out to the spirit saying, make some noise, make some noise, but nothing happened. We, we tried this many times, but we didn't hear or see a thing. In fact, it got so boring, we went home early. 
And when we got home, we looked at the little video camera, the screen, and that's what we saw, pitch black. That's what it would look like in the room when we were in there, pitch black. And we didn't hear anything. We could hear us talking on the tape. Well, it wasn't a couple months later, Becky got a new computer at work, and she had this great big monitor, had a security system she'd keep track of, a big monitor, and she had big speakers. I said, hey, let's plug this thing in and see if we see anything. So we plugged it in, and we're watching it, and it looks pitch black, just like that. And we're, all we're hearing is us talking back and forth, like we did. That doesn't work. <laughs> I turned it black. You can turn it back on. No, I turned them off. <laughs> Turn them back on. <laughs> it was part of the presentation. I turned the slide black. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Here, I'll go back a slide. <laughs> Are they on? Uh, the lights aren't on. You need to... Come on, here we go. Here we go. We go. No, we're good. I did that. I did. I made. A, I put a black slide on the screen. <laughs> I have a great AV team. They're trying to keep me in the good. There. It's, I just. I didn't warn you in advance. And then it was black in there. <laughs> So as we're watching on our, t on our screen, right, we're looking at this thing, and we could see the audio, the little lines, you know, on audio, and it would go really, the spike really big when we were talking, and then nothing. And then I noticed, and I looked down, and in one place where we're being really quiet, there's a little tiny blip. I hadn't seen it before. And so we fast-forwarded to right after we're saying, telling the ghost to make noises of bang stuff, and we cranked the speaker up as loud as we could, and a voice said, touch nothing. The hair went up on my neck. The hair went up on my head. I had goosebumps on my goosebumps. The thing is, if we're honest about our reality, our historical reality, we'd see that in all the cultures, there are myths and beliefs around the themes of death. Every culture has a myth or theme around death. I know. It's a thing. So what's this common theme? That the righteous go to paradise, the unrighteous go to Hades. Isn't that exactly what we still believe today? Righteous go to paradise and the unrighteous go to the bad place. What we believe as Christians is only changed just a tiny bit from the Jewish people and their faith in the day of Christ. In our scripture today, we read the story of the rich man who mistreated the poor beggar named Lazarus. It said, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. The time comes. We all die. And when we die, the righteous go to paradise. The unrighteous go to the bad place. In Hades where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Now, the Jewish people, they call this place Sheol. S-H-E-O-L. That's what they call Hades. And they believe that Sheol is divided into two parts. The upper boundary has what they would call paradise. Abraham's bosom is what they would call it, paradise. And they believed that this was a, a place of comfort and an eternal peace in the afterlife. It was a place of honor where the 
uh, righteousness of the dead was welcomed. But they also believed that there was a, a deeper abyss, the pit. And it was actually lots of different places in the deep pit. Some of it was uh, um, filled with flames of fire for torment, and some parts of it were freezing cold. And that was reserved for the, the unbelievers. But there was another curse, probably worse than the flames of fire or the freezing cold. It was that gap between the two where the fallen, the unbelievers, those that were down in the pits and the abyss could look up and see those living in paradise. Just like in our story where the rich man sees Lazarus at Abraham's side. So I got a question for you. Who was it that told this story in the Bible. Who's telling us a story about the rich man and Lazarus? It's Jesus. Jesus is telling the story to the Pharisees in a context that they understand. This is Jesus' story. And one of the things that we add is the fact that there is the divide. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from here to us. Once you're locked in the abyss, you're locked into the abyss. That's the belief system. Jesus said it, I believe it, and that's good enough for me. The reason I chose this parable today to preach on All Saints Day is because it describes what theologians call the intermediate state. We live after death in an intermediate state. We're all going to die, and when that day comes, we're taken to one place or another until the final day judgment. It's an intermediate state. We either go to heaven or we go to hell. I remember when I was a kid, I said hell to my grandmother. Don't say that. H-E double toothpicks. <clears throat> Here's an interesting statistic in the Bible. The context of the word heaven is used over 600 times in the Bible. Jesus talks about heaven 55 times in the book of Matthew alone. You know how many times the context of hell is brought up in the New Testament? 13 times. Only 13 times, and almost all of those, it's Jesus talking about hell. Matthew 5, 22, you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 23, 33, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Mark 9, 43, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, the unquenchable fire. I grew up in a Baptist church. I think every Sunday, that pastor talked about fire and damnation and hell. If you've been in the Baptist church, you have heard Matthew 3.18, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hung down and cast into the fire. And I can still remember that big old sausage finger pointing at us, you know. <laughs> now, for those of you that grew up Methodist, how often did you talk about hell? How often did you talk about fire and damnation? Probably not very often. 
And I actually find that really strange. Because John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he was not shy about talking about hell or the judgment. He often spoke of those two things. In his most famous sermons, one's called The Great Aziz, and the other one's called The End of Christ's Coming, he explicitly talks about and describes hell and all its implications. We just don't talk about it much. But you know what else he liked to talk about? All Saints Day. In his uh, journal... There's an entry from November 1st, 1767. November 1st, 1767. Yes, I asked Siri, how many years ago was that? And she told me 257 years ago. So 257 years ago, as he's writing in his journal, and he says of All Saints Day, it's a festival I truly love. And he went on to say, I always find this a comfortable day. Wesley talked about hell in the same comforting context as he did when he celebrated All Saints Day. It was just part of the vernacular. It was known. For some reason, we've swept it under the rug. We don't talk about this too much. And this is one of the reasons I'm discussing the intermediate state of heaven or hell on the day we celebrate the saints. Because having this conversation, it deepens our understanding of the eternal journey of our departed saints. It reinforces the hope that we have for Christ and our, with, for Christ with us in our life and death. By reflecting on our own faith, reflecting on our own choices, we can discern whether we're living in a way that honors the legacies of those that went before us. We use all saints' days, our litmus test, am I as worthy as them? I've done a few funerals for five or six of those people that we celebrated today. One case, the family says there was never a woman that was more of a saint than this one. And some of you know all of what I'm talking about. That's why we celebrate all saints' day. It's a chance to measure ourselves against those who went before us And some of you are thinking, this is wonderful, Pastor, but I think I can remember the departed without thinking about hell. That's my point. You can't. Whether you later arrive in paradise or in the depths of Hades, the concept of an intermediate state reminds us that our journey does not end in those locations. That's not where we are going. That's where we're parking ourselves for a while. One day Christ will return and he's going to gather all the souls. All the souls in the pits of hell and all of those in paradise and we stand before him in judgment. Our choices in life today echo into eternity. The bells that we rang today, they remind us of that responsibility that we hold, that we're to embrace the legacies of those that passed, and that we're to blaze a similar trail of discipleship like they did. The teachings of Jesus, he's, he's telling us, you have to be looking forward, you couldn't be looking backwards. In Luke 8, 9, 62, and Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is a powerful call of action from Jesus for all of us. We've we got to get rid of the garbage that's behind you and press forward. We're urged to live with a purpose. We're urged to focus on our journey ahead rather than being weighed down by the things and events of our past. That's what All Saints Day is about. We honor what we believe to be. And it transforms us into wanting to be that way. Earlier I talked about how 
when we look into the supernatural, it can be pretty scary. But you know, the Bible is the same way. It tells us a lot about judgment. It tells us a lot about those things to come that we may not necessarily want to think about. But I think the scariest scripture in the Bible for me is Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. That's pretty scary stuff. That is frightening. I try to remind you each week that the temptations of the world are all around us trying to consume you, trying to pull you into the darkness. And Halloween, with its imagery of, of darkness and evil, this is our time to reflect on the light of Christ. And how the early church transformed that evil day into a day of celebration for us. They brought light into a time of darkness. But it's equally important to know that there's a lot of people out there right now who have never been invited to know Christ. They're wandering the world in that darkness. Each of you, you're called to be the light that brings them to the eternal light of Christ. In closing, I want to remind you all the, the nature of John Wesley. As we prepare for this Thursday, he would want you to embrace all Hallows Eve in the spirit of fun and community. He was not a prude he would want you to have fun on Thursday. As you pass out candy from your home, you can, you can, or if you join us for the, the trunk or treat outside, remember that these occasions give you a unique opportunity to be the light of Christ in those that are coming to you. When you're handing out candy, tuck a little note or Bible verse in the bag. How wonderful it would be for the kids to find something uplifting in their treats. Or maybe it'll spark a conversation with their parents in the morning about faith. And it might serve as a, just a, a gentle reminder that while the world celebrates the spooky in the dark, we have a reason to rejoice in the light of Christ. And we can do it right alongside them. One final word of advice, don't make the mistake of handing out healthy snacks like granola bars. <laughs> Trust me, I learned the hard way. I was forever that guy. <laughs> May your candy bags be full, your costumes be creative, and remember, calories don't count on Halloween. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. And all we have to do is believe in him. And he promised us a reservation in that place called paradise and an eternal life with Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the times that you make us look back at the things we definitely don't always want to be linking about. Because we know that we live in a balanced world. In fact, your son said it isn't so balanced. He said, the gate is narrow, but broad is the road that leads to darkness. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, that we're to seek that narrow path and that narrow gate and to bring as many along with as we can. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.